to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense. From culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from and the businesses and more importantly the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. Welcome to this week's episode and the main change this week in hospitality world is that in England at least we now have a roadmap of dates for reopening and I'm not going to go into the nuances of those now since I think most of us are really saying the same thing. More support, VAT cut, rates cut, hospitality is safer than homes, really all the same things we've been saying for quite some time. Of more relevance now perhaps is another extension to the rent moratorium and a more concrete framework that motivates landlords to at least share the burden with tenants. And of course, whatever Rishi has to say in next week's budget. The Times seem to be doing a pretty good job of, shall we say, leaking information well in advance, and it looks like the government are hearing the message that hospitality is broken and is going to need further support. More on that next week, I suspect. Now on to this week's guest and we are off to Scotland and a few people have recommended that I speak to Sarah at the Real Food Cafe. Sarah's been pretty vocal throughout the pandemic in representing the Scottish hospitality sector. And since geographically I end up speaking a lot to people from southern England, I wanted to grab the chance to head north of the border again. There are a couple of things specifically that I wanted to chat with Sarah about. In the first instance, how does somebody go from being the managing director of a pretty decent sized company in the city of London to buying an ex little chef by the side of an obscure road in rural Scotland? And along the way, driving revenue to over £1.7 million per year from a pretty small footprint. And secondly, how Sarah has embraced technology to revolutionise how this roadside cafe operates. Motivated by the pandemic, but along the way learning some really interesting things that I think the hospitality sector at large is going through. Probably five years worth of technical evolution in just one year as we move from ordering from a human to ordering on an app. Not an evening restaurant service, but very much so across the casual daytime sector. And this leads to challenges around the user experience, but some potential big benefits if, as appears to be the case, spend per head increases whilst labour costs decrease. Sarah's also makes some great points about the infrastructure that busy tourism destinations are going to need to have in place if we are to experience the staycation boom most of us are expecting. It's not just about business being ready, but car parks and toilets and roads and so much more. I very much hope you enjoy the conversation and please don't forget, it would really help me out if you could leave a review for the podcast and hit the subscribe button on your player of choice. It really helps the algorithms give more exposure to the show and more listeners means I can get more interesting guests to come on and chat. A win-win. Simon Tolson, a huge thanks for your review on Apple Podcasts this week. Thank you so much for taking the time. Right, let's get over and meet Sarah. Enjoy the show. Sarah Heward, founder of The Real Food Cafe in Scotland. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hugely appreciated. You are a nine-hour drive, apparently, from me, Sarah. But can you just explain to people listening, uh, whereabouts are you in the world? Well, firstly, Mark, thanks for having me, as they say. Um, So we are in a location called Tyndrum, which is basically um, right on in the northern corner of... um, Stirlingshire on the Argyle border. Um, we're at the um, far northwest tip of the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. Wow, um, amazing. And I'm literally on the very south coast of England. So we're, we're pretty much as far. You can go a little bit for how far north can you go from you before you hit the ocean again? Oh, you can go a long way north. Um, west, the ocean is about 40 miles west from us. Um, but you can go a long way north. Scotland's a lot bigger than most people think um but just to kind of put things in context mark the children in our village so the village where the cafe is sited has a population of about 130 and the children in the village that are going to secondary school 
go on a hundred mile round trip to secondary school every day. Do they? Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? That sounds like the sort of story my dad would have told me when I was a kid, you know, about the fact that he had to traipse through the snow with no shoes and stuff like that. But genuinely, a hundred of them, that's amazing, isn't it? So yeah, bro, I love Scotland. It's such a stunning place. So it is remote. It's um, Tyndrum, the village of Tyndrum means literally, it's, it's Gaelic, and the literal translation is house on the ridge. And why it's so called is that Tyndrum is actually on the great watershed of Scotland. So, uh, you know, the water flows in two different directions from the peaks around Tyndrum. It's literally kind of on the spine of, of north, northern Scotland. But it's a main route from what's called the central belt of Scotland and England. So anybody coming up from England or from the central belt of Scotland, i.e. the big urban conurbations of Glasgow or Edinburgh, and they're, if they're heading for the northwest of Scotland – which includes things like Ben Nevis, a uh, very popular destination for Three Peakers, etc. All the way, all the Western Isles, um, they will have to more or less have to pass through Tyndrum. So it's like a bit of a funnel. And in a normal year, about four million vehicles pass through Tyndrum, and um, about over a hundred thousand walkers pass through because it's also on a very famous walking route, world famous. Um, called the West Highland Way, which is a 95-mile route running from Glasgow that ends in Fort William. So it's remote, very remote, really, for mainland um, Scotland. Uh, mainland, you, you know, and by, the, by virtue, that would be mainland United Kingdom. Um, but it's busy. It really is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. four million cars. That's incredible. That's, uh, yeah, that's some passing trade. Well, the people listening might think, why on earth is Mark chatting to somebody who, uh, you know, is in quite such a remote part of Britain? But you have this amazing uh, voice as a business that's way beyond your size as such a sort of remote roadside cafe uh, for many reasons that are going to become very clear as we chat over the next sort of 40 minutes or so. So congratulations on all you've achieved. But you've also won multiple awards. Uh, again, perhaps unusual for what was once a, a little chef, you know, in, in a remote part of Scotland but can you tell me a little bit maybe about a couple of either your your favorite or most memorable awards because I think that will give people an indication of of just sort of what a unique and special uh, venue you are and why actually you're so well known well um first of all let me just kind of put that in context so 16 years ago I bought, bought a derelict little chef um and little chefs whatever you thought of them uh, their menu and their offering they were invariably, you know, the person who sat in the head office and put the pins in the map and picked the spots, they they kind of knew what they were doing when it came to passing, tra- tra- you know, travellers, road travellers. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they, they got that right, um, but they didn't get the offering right. And I think they must have found it, you know, it's just very, very hard in that location. Um, so they'd given up and gone away. and. Um, I was, my late husband was Scottish and we had a holiday house not too far away from there. So we knew Tyndrum as a location. And um, prior to working, uh, prior to moving to Scotland, I was actually working in the city of London. And I was managing director for over a decade, actually, of um, Corny and Barrow wine bars. So the Corny and Barrow wine bars actually are, are no more. But um, at the time, they were a a thriving group of busy, power-drinking locations at landmark spots throughout the city. And um, I'd done that for over 10 years. My husband was working in the oil oil industry, traveling all over the place to, you know, hellish places like the Congo and Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, And... We decided for a variety of different reasons um, to buy this derelict little chef when we kind of stumbled on it and um, moved to our holiday cottage, which wasn't so far away. And all we knew was that whatever we did with it had to be better than what it had been in its previous life. Um, and we just, we loved the whole part, you know, we, 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 we wanted to get out of the rat race and we, we loved the space and I'm very into outdoor pursuits. I'm actually an Ironman. Um, and so it kind of all seemed to make sense for us. It was the right time for us to do it. We felt, um, and, but we knew because we were in such a kind of remote location 
to get our name out there, we were really going to have to and get people to to, to kind of clock us and want to make the effort to come. We were going to have to do a really good job on the marketing. Um, so I think the award that probably stands out the most, this is a very long answer, Mark, to your question, but the 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 award that stands out the most is probably the first one that we ever won. So what happened was when we bought this little chef and, and started to kind of turn it into our dream cafe, um, we learned, to, you know, a number of large lessons very quickly. Um, and the first one was that we'd got totally carried away with our enthusiasm. And we had overlooked the fact that in order to trade we would need staff accommodation because the village is very remote and because the population is so small there's over employment in the village and so employers have to bring their their staff their teams in and if you want to do that you need accommodation to put them in um so we suddenly found that we had to we were going to need to buy accommodation in a place where there is very little accommodation um we were actually very lucky and we were able to secure something. But, of course, that really used up a lot of our working capital, our, our cash. We hadn't put money aside for that. So um, we'd spent, we ended up spending a lot more than we anticipated. Um, that was just one of the mistakes we made. Anyway, the long and the short of it was we weren't left with very much marketing budget at all. So um, we kind of thought, well, what, you know, what are we going to do? And um, I used to, I still do, listen to a lot of Radio 4, and I used to love the food program with Sheila Dillon. And um, they had the Food and Farming Awards, and they had an award on there for the best takeaway. So we'd only been open about six months, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to enter this because I think what we're trying to do here is something a bit different. And we'd been visited by an author called Annette Hope, who writes about the social history of food. And she had really got it straight away. She said, you know, I understand what you're trying to do here, Sarah. You are trying to serve popular fast food items, but, you know, do it ethically and do it well. Um, So we entered the Food and Farming Awards for Best Takeaway in 2005, six months after we opened, and we won it. And uh, much to our surprise, we won it. And as a result, Sheila Dillon came up to Tyndrum uh, and did a live interview with us on her program, the food program. Six million people heard that interview, a lot of them foodies. And so suddenly we were on the map. Amazing. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? That is the most comprehensive answer I've ever been given, to be fair to a question. Don't ask Sarah. Me any questions, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> here all night. <laughs> well, you just answered nineteen, so we're going to be fine. And I'm slightly concerned that your first bit of publicity got you six million listeners, and I don't know. I didn't check the numbers for last week, uh, which was Michelle Rue. It was probably a little bit more than normal, but I don't think I hit, I hit six million. It was more than six. <laughs> so I can tell you that. But uh, okay, well, you know, amazing start after only six months because we're going to come to sort of the changes you made and what the business is now, but. Just to put in, in, in context of what you've got now then, you mentioned the number of people coming through us at the door. Pre-COVID, you were turning over £1.7 million. You were serving 200,000 people uh, a year from what's really a pretty small footprint. Presumably, this is a pretty pretty slick, fast-paced operation because that's a pretty immense amount of people to be able to serve from that style of cafe, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it's, we have built an extension onto it that's got about, um, and, you know, without social distancing in normal times, has got about 55 covers so um but yes i mean you're right the asset is sweating uh, when we're serving you know a huge number of people which we can be when I mean, we can serve up to two thousand people a day um now some of those is just for drinks and you know coffees or some of them might be a bag of chips but um you know it, it's a lot of people on both sides of the counter when you're up to those kind of numbers in in you know, in that kind of location. Um, So yes, it's, it's can be very busy. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fast place. But, and, and sorry, talking about uh, a portion of chips, so the, the original concept, because you were a little bit of foodie even back in your time in London, I think, weren't you? But your, your original concept wasn't necessary to be to be quite so fish and chip orientated. And that came from uh, a, an unusual influence from the bank, I suppose. They don't always have the most the best ideas. But can you just tell me about when you went in for funding and how that 
pivoted the model and I suppose what your perception of fish and chips was before you had that meeting? Well I, I went from being managing director of Corning Barrow which in the city of London which was you know it, it was quite a sexy job. Um, I had an account in Bond Street at Ralph Lauren um, for instance and um, I went from that to um, having this derelict little chef in Tyndrum. I mean, all our friends thought that, you know, we had lost our minds. They couldn't believe it. And in some respects, they were probably right. Um, so when we moved Lock, Stock and Barrel up to Scotland, my late husband, who was Scottish, said, you know, we're going to need to move banks. Um, I'll introduce you to Isabel at the... Um, at the bank and you know we'll we'll go and have a chat with her so we went to see her and she was fantastic um you know people give the banks a really bad time and and, and I've had some terrible times with the banks and actually this bank uh went on to you know went on to try to blackmail us um and almost put us out of business but it's it's often so, it's just so much to do with the person that you're dealing with and she was brilliant and Isabel took one look at me in my kind of slick outfit um designer outfit with my Gucci handbag over my um over my arm and said you know she said you know what, what are you going to do with this site Sarah and I said well, well um you know my plan is to have an upmarket coffee shop and and you know uh, artisan bakery now this was 16 years ago and it was in the highlands of Scotland okay um, you were lucky if you could get anything more than a, a cup of Nescafe at that time, all right? So she just laughed at me and she said, you are not in central London now, Sarah. And um, But she was she was so nice. You know, she wasn't saying it in a way to be um, a smart ass. She was, she was saying it because she wanted to help. She said, you know, if you open a fish and chip shop in Tyndrum, you won't go wrong. So I remember like, gulping and um and and you know I, I just kind of doing a, a goldfish impression and thinking I can't ignore that so I kind of came out of the conversation reeling um she said you know I'll lend you the money um that you're after if you if you do that so I said okay I'll do it so I remember then phoning all my friends and saying right um who knows who likes fish and chips who's got a good chippy near them I need to learn how to make fish and chips quickly and um so uh, I, you know, one of my friends who's down on in London had a house on the south coast, and she said, "You need to come down to Brighton. I'll introduce you to a few people here." And I ended up going down there and working for a week in fish and chip shop, and that was my first experience of fish and chips. And um, obviously, you know, it was a baptism, baptism of fire, and I, I learned loads. In hindsight, I would I would do it slightly differently now. Um, I am actually starting a new food business at the moment. And, um, you know, I'm learning from the kind of mistakes I made there. Um, the first thing I've done now is I've joined the trade association um, industry body. Um, and, you know, they are helping me, guiding me, signposting me through the whole process. And I think if I'd have joined the National Federation of Fish Fryers from the get go, it would have saved me quite a lot of pain. I mean, I'm now we're now members of the National Federation of Fish Fryers and they're fab. Fantastic. So I can't recommend being, you know, doing doing that highly enough. I do very much believe in reaching out and asking other operators for help. I don't think that was wrong. Um, but I don't think I did it strategically enough um, in the, the you know the first instance, and I'm trying to do it a lot more strategically this time around. So um, I am approaching chief executives at the moment of food companies that I think have real relevance to the one that um, I'm trying to set up, and it might not be you know the same product at all; it could be a completely different product, but they've got the same values, or they've got, for instance, the same kind of manufacturing strategy or they've got the same um they've got you know routes to market that i'm interested in and so i'm i'm learning from you know i'm trying to develop what what i did which was kind of very rudimentary in that you know the first time around Mm, amazing i can imagine how entertained your friends were not only had you gone to uh the countryside and bought a in, in essence an old little chef but now you were also working in a fish and chip shop in brighton they must have really thought you were having some sort of crisis but hats off to you because that is the sort of you know entrepreneurship just whatever it takes 
to do it that's needed. Um, so you, you sort of spoken, I suppose, the need to learn fish and chips. Was, was there certain things that you'd learned? Because Corny and Barrow, in essence, you know, wine merchants since 1780, as you mentioned, had a number of venues in London. Was there stuff, and, you, and you'd worked very much sort of there for a long time and worked your way up to be MD. So was there stuff that you'd learned in that business that you could also bring into the cafe? And if so, what, what sort of things from your sort of career history with them were, were transferable? Um, no, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I mean, most of my time at Corning Barra, I, I really loved it. And, you know, I owe a lot to it. And um, I had a boss there called Chris Brown, who was, you know, uh, he taught me a huge amount. Um, I owe him an awful lot. Um, and I'm still in touch with him. And, you know, he still guides me on things now and occasionally consults for us. Um I think that, I mean, there's so much that I, you know, we would be here till tomorrow. But I think the kind of primary thing which I took away from um, Corny and Barrow is that, is this whole thing around quality and, um, you know, your your positioning um, and the importance of, of, of positioning and offering a quality you know it's all around quality and positioning mark um that's the kind of short way to say it mm. um yeah so it doesn't matter what you do basically you just fundamentally got to do it well because they are extremes of business i suppose isn't it corny corny and barrel was very grand wasn't it um yes i mean it had a, an incredible uh, pedigree. When I joined, they had three royal warrants. They were established in 1780. Um, I mean, you know, it was a very, very blue chip company. The wine bar side of it was far was far more modern and in some ways kind of cutting edge. Um, but it was, you know, it was owned by the same company that owned the wine merchants, and it was trading under the same name. So. You know, we had to be really aware all the time that everything we did was reflecting on the name of the group company and the wine merchants with three royal warrants. And, um, you know, that gave us a really good competitive advantage and unique selling point. But that had to be protected at all times. Mm. So, well, you've cer- certainly more freedom now then I, I imagine in what you're doing I just got to bring us up to date slightly so if, if you started with this fish and chip shop very quickly award-winning how much of that initial idea of the sort of you know artisan bakery great coffee uh how much have you now managed to bring that in and is that complicated because that's that sort of unusual style I suppose to sit next to fish and chips and, and can you sort of talk about were there some sort of key pivots I suppose over the year where you could sort of be brave enough I guess to, to bring that in and know that your core business was still going to be protected yeah um over the years we've you know we've bought in a large a variety of baking and other things too so fish and chips is still our kind of core product um but we have enhanced it a lot it's a complicated operation for the size of it to be honest we have, for instance, we have really kind of gone into the gluten-free market and I think established ourselves as a, you know, a bit of a, a market leader in gluten-free fish and chips, for instance. We held, and we would be holding, what's the word? Inaugural. Yeah. 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 Um, gluten-free fortnight at the end of 2019, which was really successful. And um, we intend to make that an annual occurrence and actually to develop that into a national uh, event, if we can, with you know all fish, you know, a lot more fish and chip shops joining in. So we have, we've, you know, we've certainly gradually built up the whole menu and the offering. The kind of whole COVID thing is t- is taking us into slightly different kind of direction and strategy. In that. When we closed during the first lockdown, we invested in an online platform and we decided to go cashless. And when we opened again in mid-July, we were open for 15 weeks from mid-July till the end of November before we had to close again. Um, we you know, cut our teeth on that new um, online platform. 
and a, you know, huge, massive learning curve, very steep, and you know, big change for all of us and our customers, which we're still, you know, we're still working on it all. But we got some really good learning out of it. And well, one of the things we learned was just how much more people will spend online. The average spend was significantly different. And if I said to you that in that 15 weeks, as a result of the online platform, we took an extra £55,000 in revenue, um, you know, and you think what our average spend is, uh, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Mm. Um, so, we, you know, we were we were staggered by that. Um, but also we realised that um, we've got an opportunity now to really push our baking to um out and we are setting up to launch that as a kind of separate business um an addition to the cafe um doing retailing it through e-commerce and the online platform okay D- direct to the consumer or wholesaling it or? yeah direct to the consumer amazing Okay. So yeah, I'm really interested, actually. It was one of the key things that I wanted to chat to you about was this sort of your experience in the pandemic and the sort of uh, the pivots, I suppose, that word's been so overused this year. But um, yeah, you, you, you did really embrace tech because that's quite brave. I mean, it was quite brave to sort of you know, start introducing artisan bakery and, and flash coffee into, uh, into the fish and chip shop. But I suppose you're always sort of trailblazing and staying ahead. What's the reaction of that? Because it can be quite challenging in those sort of environments. And, and I suppose... Much as it's, I don't know, it's an interesting learning experience, I suppose, as an operator, because we've done similar. But how was the customer reaction to being told that they needed to sit down, order on their phones, you know, pay remotely? Uh, uh, were they positive or mixed? And, and how did you manage, I suppose, the training of people who perhaps weren't used to operating that way? Okay, well, it's been a challenge, okay? Um, and it's still, it's you know, we're still working on it. Um, the vast majority of customers are uh, were very happy and very grateful i think they were grateful that we were open that we'd survived that um you know that that it was safe um and that the food was good i mean the the most important thing at the end of the day is that the product is good um so the vast majority of customers to be honest embraced it But there were some that really didn't and they really didn't like it and they found it very hard and, you know, we got abuse and complaints because of it. Um, And I think some of that was because of the situation. Um, You know, the levels of frustration um, that were uh, were, um, vented at from time to time were you know weren't good and you know I guess that's how the whole thing the kind of be kind thing has become um has been one of the kind of slogans of the pandemic and you know we've all heard about it in the supermarkets as well haven't we staff being abused by customers I'm not saying it was you know it was a daily occurrence but it happened more than it had before the pandemic started um which you know hardly ever happened before then to be honest um so there was a bit of that, and um, you know, some of that was frustration at the whole situation, but some of it was frustration at technology and not wanting to change. Um, and you know, we we as management, we've been looking at that, and we've been, you know, I think we've got to take some responsibility for that, and we've got to do what we can to um, to ease that situation and and learn from what happened in that fifteen weeks, and that's what we're doing. So we are. Um, looking at the system and improving it, uh, making the descriptions better, making we've had more photography done, uh, getting the layout and the, you know the system easier to use, trying to improve the Wi-Fi connections, not easy in the middle of nowhere, um, trying to um, train the staff so that they are more confident and better equipped to deal with objections. Um, trying to overcome whatever objections there may be from people. So um, with the staff, we've, re- we've rewritten a whole lot of training materials and we're looking at, um, we're developing a new platform to for the staff to kind of interact with those. Uh, it's called Gather Town and we've created the cafe, a kind of virtual cafe online. And, you know, they can go in and to the library and, you know, have a look at, 
different training tools and look at videos and things like that. So it makes it kind of more fun learning environment, especially while people are at home. Um, so, and we're in, we're also looking at the messaging to the consumer. So, you know, our, improving our signage and our messaging. So trying to break the whole thing down and, um, you know, learn from the 15 weeks and every objection and every issue, try to find a solution for it. Mm. And what's the motivation? Because clearly, um, you know, there's a there's a health motivation, I guess, in the fact that, you know, contactless payments and all that kind of stuff. But presumably, this is this is bigger than that. This is an operational issue. And I guess, you know, is, is COVID in essence, making you do things that, that you sort of wanted to perhaps try before, but it gives you the, the opportunity or the confidence to do it. And I guess, you know, what, what business improvements are you, do you think you're going to see off the back yeah. of automating this journey? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, we we may never have got around to doing this, or we might have got around to doing it in three or four years. We might, in you know, we may not have dug deep enough to kind of stick with it and you know get it to work. Um, but you know, going cashless and um, and and getting that you know going onto the online platform, it it it. I mean, just in the higher average spend alone. Um, I mean, if I um, extrapolate forward what we would have taken in 2019, um, had we've got the online platform, we think that our 1.65 million would have become nearly 2 million. And, you know, when you take off, if, given that all your fixed overheads are covered, all you've got to take off is your food cost, a little bit of labor and some packaging you know, that's a hell of a lot more profit. Mm, that's amazing. Why, why do you, sorry to interrupt, but why do you think people spend more ordering on a phone than ordering from a human? It, it's really intriguing that, isn't it? Why? It is. it's, it's nuts, isn't it? But if someone's sitting in the car park outside the cafe ordering on their phone, why are they going to spend three or four pounds more per transaction than they would if they were coming into the cafe and ordering face-to-face? Well, we think um, the there's probably a whole lot of reasons, but we think that one of the primary reasons is that people have time to absorb the whole menu. You know, they're not under any pressure. They can, they're only under the pressure to put themselves under. When you're standing at a till, because our old system was that you queued up, there's usually a kind of queue out the door all the time. But you queued up, queue went forward, you got to the front of the queue and you made, you placed your order. And then you went and grabbed a table or went and sat outside. And um, or waited for your takeaway. Um, and we think it's because people aren't under pressure. You know, they've got time to look at the whole menu. And we, um, and also the, possibly there's something about kind of embarrassment there. You mm, know, I was just thinking that, yeah, maybe not being judged when you're ordering. Yeah, because I know when I've gone to other fish and chip shops and um, doing market research or because I, I wanted them somewhere and I wanted a chippy, I took, for instance, I took my mum to Edinburgh during you know when the during the summer when the regulations were relaxed a little bit, I took my mum down to Edinburgh for a couple of nights, and uh, we went and had a, a chippy and um, sat overlooking the sea, you know, eating our fish and chips in the car. And um, I, when I ordered, I ordered twice as much as we needed because I was curious and I wanted to see what the things were like. Now, you know, I might not be normal because I'm in the industry, but um, I never would have ordered all that if we were sitting at a table. I would have been too embarrassed. Yeah. So um, I think there's a number of different reasons, but I do think it comes down to the fact that people are looking at the menu and they're not under pressure. Um, so, that, you know, they're enjoying, a, 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 you know, a bit of kind of shopping experience. And, um, you know, when they're standing at the till under time pressure um, our, and our staff, it's, you know, try as we might to, get, to tr- do the upselling training. Um, you know, when they they're under they they're under pressure because they're seeing other people looking at them. They don't want to do the upselling. They just want to get the customer served and processed as quickly as possible and get on to the next customer. Mm. Um, so we're able with the online platform to actually merchandise and market to people. You know, when you go to the supermarket, Mark, you don't. Um, you might go in for um, you know, I don't know, four beers or something or a bottle of wine. You know me well. How, what do you come out with though? Jam donut. <laughs> <laughs> 
shut up. Okay, let's, let's not, you know, answer. the right answer. You come out with a trolley load of food. Okay? Yeah. You come out with six pizzas and 12 bottles of wine, okay? You went in for a bottle of wine and you come out with three bars of chocolate, six pizzas and 12 bottles of wine if you're anything like me, okay? Um, and But you only went in to get a bottle of wine. Yeah. Um, now, in the supermarkets, no one's actually selling to you, are they? They're not standing there saying, buy this, buy that, buy the other thing. But what they've done is they've marketed it and they've positioned it so that, you you know, they've made it look attractive. And that, I think, is what we're doing on our online platform. Mm. That- what, what, um, what tech are you using, by the way? What platform are you using? Um, Prio Day. Okay. Yeah. Know it well. Yeah. When I mean, you're not alone in this experience either, I've spoken to a few people. Brew house and uh, kitchen were the same. You know, and I think all been surprised. I think there's a lot of us in the industry who were very reluctant to replace. Well, not even replace. Just change. I suppose the service and make it much more tech orientated right at that front position, and, and didn't really want to do it from a you know fear of, of of missing out on some of that sort of customer experience journey but wanted to do it from a you know ease of use and tech and speed of service and paying in advance and for, for lots of other reasons but i think the key thing that most people have been surprised by is actually yeah, how much the customers seem to be enjoying it and uh, and yeah certainly ordering more albeit it's not the same for everyone you mentioned supermarkets we've certainly had to do it at our venue where we almost like when you go to the supermarket through the self-serve tills where there's always a couple of people generally to sort of help if there's any problems and we've almost had to do the same so that we can stand there and go look you know it's this button and you press that button and and hand hold people through that journey and then if there is a problem you know certainly for us we've still got that sort of worst case scenario okay come to the till we'll sort you out and we will we will still take some money Um, but yeah it's been interesting I think what you touched on about, you know, the whole customer experience and the brand, but that's really important. You know, it, if you, well, I suppose there's a couple of things. First of all, on the kind of the direction that the industry is going in. I think when, when Weatherspoons, you know, a few years ago when Weatherspoons launched their, uh, their app, um, that was the beginning of all of this from, you know, as I see it. That was that was a that was a kind of watershed moment. And I was, when I read about that, I thought, oh gosh, you know, this is, it's a matter of time until the whole industry goes this way. Um, and now if you look at, you know, what McDonald's are doing and um, and the kind of advertising and stuff they've, around their um, remote online ordering, um, you know, they are, they are bringing it really into the mainstream, aren't they? Um, I think that it's legitimate, very legitimate, to be have concern uh, about the kind of whole customer experience and um, you know the kind of brand, uh, the brand experience, and kind of you know making sure that the customer gets a kind of gets a bit of that, even if it's a remote experience. So when we first opened up in July, we had nobody coming into the building at all. Um, all of the ordering, if you wanted the food, you had to order on your phone. It was all from outside and the staff brought the food out to your car. And, you know, we talked at the time about making, you know, how can we make the cafe experience? How can we give the customer the cafe experience? And you've got to try to find ways of doing that. You can't just kind of forget it. It's a really legitimate point. And, you know, from the branding on your packaging, you know, the quality of your packaging, the, obviously the quality of your product um but also the you know the the people being there to help so we kitted all the staff out in high vis uniforms and there was good presence in the car park so if people were having a problem they could put their window down and someone would go over to them and you know help them through help them get the order and we had a tablet as well so worst case scenario if somebody didn't have a phone they could order, the staff member could process the order on the tablet. Mm. Yeah, perfect. I think exactly. You need you need that backup just in case. I think we've seen a few, you know, and it, it's, it's quite heartbreaking sometimes. You see a sort of, I don't know, maybe an elderly couple who just want a cup of coffee and a slice of cake or something like that, and you see them getting their phone out, and I feel terribly guilty. Uh, but it's very hard to have multiple systems running at the same time, and all we'll try and do, obviously, is is send over a, a member of the team. But, yeah, well, look, you know, hats off to you for that speed of movement. I just want to tell you, you've been very open about the impact of the pandemic, and I just want to talk about that sort of briefly. Um, how close, when, when it first happened, and and you first had to shut the doors. I know you shut the doors a few days early and, and, and it was a big decision to do that before you were forced to do so. How close were you? How, how much of you were thinking at the time, this could be the end, we may not reopen? Oh, um, no, I never thought that. 
Um, I didn't think it would go on this long, mm. um, but I never thought that. Um, I thought, you know, I, I still don't think, you know, I think we're survivors and we will do what's necessary to survive. We've got a great business, Mark. So, you know, it's worth digging really deep. And, yeah. and you know, there's also this thing I've got, this kind of mantra about having faith in yourself. Um and, you know, I've been taught that by people who are really much cleverer than me. I've been shown that by people. I've been lucky to have some people in my life who have shown me that, you know, you you should never lose faith, whether, you know, you've got to have faith in something. And if you don't have faith in, you know, whether it's a higher power uh, or, um, you know, some people religious, um, you've got to have faith in yourself and the people around you, um, you know, we have a great team and we will do what is ever is necessary to keep this business going if it's the right thing to do. And we believe it is the right thing to do. So we will, we'll get through it. I never thought we wouldn't get through it. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had as much money as possible to take some of the immediate heat out of the situation. So we borrowed nearly a quarter of a million pounds from the bank. And, you know, we're going to get through that. We're burning at the moment 15 to 16,000 pounds a month. Yeah, you know that we're a small business now. I know there's businesses that are burning a whole, a whole heap more money than that. Um, you know, Creef Hydro, that's not a million miles from us. At the start of the pandemic, apparently they had thirteen hundred and fifty staff. They've now got three hundred and fifty on furlough, and are burning about twenty five thousand pounds a day because they've got a huge estate of property. Um, so you know it's. It's but fifteen to sixteen thousand pounds to us is a lot of money. Um, so we can't go on forever, but it won't go on forever, will it? You know? No, of Instead course of not. Oh. Yeah. And the government's gonna have to do more for our sector. Simple as that. Okay. Yeah, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Sorry, sorry to butt in again, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I think Weatherspoons are losing four million pounds a week. Uh, we're losing a thousand pounds a day every day that we're shut. The industry is is hemorrhaging cash. We're obviously, you know, one of the biggest expenses we've got is yes, our teams are furloughed, but we're still paying, uh, you know, NI and, and pension contributions for them. So that's one of the ways that we're hemorrhaging cash. Then we've got this deferred rent issue and all the other stuff that's going on around it. What's your thoughts on? the government response do you think they get it i mean we're, we're being told you know maybe you'll open in april maybe may and i appreciate the situation you know which obviously i presume doesn't help either as you've got a different situation potentially in england and in scotland if you were sat with rishi and boris you know what would you be saying to them well um gosh uh that's not maybe the best question to ask me i'm um I'm... <laughs> i can bleep out any swear words yeah. it's no problem um <laughs> um i'm you know, I, I, I don't just want to kind of, it's easy, it, it's actually really easy, I think, to just be bish bosh bash on this. Um, because the, the, let's just say, I think the response has been very poor. Um, and I think at this, uh, we're running the, we're running the danger that the whole furlough scheme when it comes to hospitality and tourism will have been a complete waste of money because it's only any point in furloughing these staff if there's actually businesses for them to come back to work in. And, um, at this rate, if it, you know, if we don't get more support, there won't be, or there'll be, you know, very few. So a lot of that furlough money will have been wasted. And that's not to say that I decry be, be, people the furlough money that they're getting, but the idea of furlough is to retain the staff to come back to work in the businesses. And if the businesses aren't there or haven't got the capital to get going again, then, you know, the furlough has been a waste. Um, I think that the, uh, I mean, I really, I tried to kind of keep an open mind, but when they withdrew that £1,000 per employee that they promised for the end of January for people, you know, that was 20 grand to us. We've got 20 staff on furlough. That was absolutely shameful, in my opinion. Um, I think the government will have to do more. Um, and I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be VAT um, and possibly, um, cha- you know, commuting the... Uh, gr- the loans into grant money. Um, I mean, we're saddled with so much. Those of us who get through it are saddled with so much debt that we can't, we're not going to be able to, you know, we're not going to be healthy businesses. We're not going to be able to invest properly in our futures. 
so um, you know, to get us going again properly, we we're going to need to we're going to need help. They're going to have to do it. I don't see there's any way around that. Um, and I'm, you know, I expect them to do that. Mm. Rishi keeps saying that he's not really going to give anything away until uh, you know the budget in March, albeit that a lot of the information we seem to get seems to get leaked rather than announced. So you know, this week there were either some uh, some rumours or some leaks that VAT wouldn't be one of them. Do you think the government understand the sort of perilous nature? And it's not just us, but clearly hospitality, you know, is in the eye of the storm. Do you think they get it, or, or are you, and are you optimistic, you know, that more support will come, or are you uh, are you concerned that maybe they just don't comprehend it? I don't don't get it or they don't care um i mean you know look at brexit <laughs> um and you know before he was elected boris johnson did say f business didn't he um i don't know maybe yeah apparently oh, i mean I, I read that somewhere there was one famous quote where he, he said you know f business and i thought oh you'll never you know you can never be prime minister and uh, you know when i heard that um but you know I, I don't, I don't know um, if they don't get it or they just don't care. I don't know, but you know, Brexit is a disaster for certain sectors at the moment. Um, but the hospitality and tourism sector is so high profile. It's such a big employer and such a big tax. You know, we we pay such great taxes under normal situations, um, normal circumstances. That I don't see that they, they're going to. You know, I think they're going to have to do something. Hmm. Okay. Well, it will it'll be interesting. Like, hopefully, we'll we'll know soon enough. Um, how did you feel? The the other sort of big thing, I suppose, that happened is that when we were allowed to open, certainly, you know, I suppose I, I speak slightly England centric, but I, th- I think it was probably the same. You know, it was a huge amount of, of investment in uh, you know safety measures and PPE and maybe you know outside space. And I know a lot of pubs and bars and restaurants were putting up marquees, you know, ready for Christmas. You know, we put in it more more work than I would say. You know, certainly your supermarkets and your, and your garage and lots of places from from making people feel covid secure yet still the narrative the sort of press narrative was very much blaming hospitality for the issue so not only did we invest a lot of cash we sort of proved that we were safe from a data perspective but then we got blamed for transmissions and we were told to to close you know despite this investment what's your thoughts on on that yeah i think it's all very valid um you know i think that the way that the media have uh, presented some of this has been you know really shocking as well um i mean i'll give you another example um a couple of weeks ago the supreme court ruled that a, uh, a the rule that insurers have to pay a number of um businesses for their business interruption policies now the way that that was presented in the media made it look like we were all going to get paid out you know, oh, hallelujah, you know, there's going to be, this is the landmark ruling. And I'm sure that a lot of um, hospitality businesses were on the phone in short order to their insurers. But in actual fact, the wording was very specific and it only applied to a, you know, very narrow, um, a very narrow uh, policy wording and a very, really relatively very few businesses. Mm. So that was yeah, you're, a you're absolutely right. misrepresentation, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, the number of texts I had that day from you know my parents included and uh, various people saying, "Oh, you know, is this good news for you? Is this good news for you?" And I was like, "Well, I, I already knew in advance that it definitely wouldn't apply to two of my businesses. There was a slim chance it may apply to one." So I was like, oh, "Maybe." And then, sure enough, we had one of those you know two-page, long-winded nonsense letter that I didn't really even comprehend, but fundamentally just saying, "No, you don't qualify." And that, I think it's a tiny percentage um, of the sector that will. It's, it's the same with grants. Any any hospitality venue with a uh, rateable value over fifty-one thousand didn't qualify for any grant funding and the number of times I was told you know all the grant funding you got all the grant funding you got and I was like until we were actually closed in November when I think we qualified for three thousand pounds but up until that point we hadn't qualified for anything and trying to get people to understand that furlough actually cost the business yes it's wonderful that hopefully the team will still be there to rebuild the business but fundamentally it is a cost to business and I do feel that 
you know, with furlough, we are actually just saving the government from having to put everybody, you know, the admin of putting everybody on uh, unemployment benefit and housing kind of benefit and all that kind of stuff. So I don't fully buy the story that it's purely there to protect the businesses. I think we're saving the government a load of hassle whilst also, you know, with the contributions that we're making to national insurance, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the amounts that, uh, that the government are getting from that actually means that it's not costing a huge amount more than it would do if all of those people all of a sudden were unemployed and, and claiming the various benefits. I haven't done the maths on that, so I'm sure it is um, still to the benefit. I totally, I, I, you know, I, I'm sure that that's, I'm sure that's right. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it's also about massaging the numbers, isn't it? And, um, you know, looking better that there's not all these millions of people unemployed. Mm, absolutely. Well, uh, we're. Um, I've got to move away from the the pandemic because there's a couple of other things I want to chat about, and uh, we could both continue to be uh, irritated. We may touch on it with with regards to what comes next because it probably has an impact. But you're also very well known for sort of you know sustainability, caring about uh, food, where food comes from. What's what's your sort of observation, I suppose, in that sector of the market around changing food trends? You know, there's been a lot of stuff on plant based based diets, flexitarianism. Mm. Uh, where does that fit into to fish and chips and your cafe? You mentioned gluten. You, is there a sort of bigger picture? Do you think in in a, in a movement of sustainability around food yeah i mean i think um you know the better fish and chip shops are you know they're they're good on all of this um and um for a for a very fragmented kind of m- almost mom and pop shop industry i think the fish and chip industry is pretty good uh, at least the you know the ones that the the award winners and the ones at the cutting edge of it are good on all this stuff um you know when i talk to my colleagues um in the in in the industry um well they're right on they're right on the ball with it um so stuff like um you know sustainable fish um the msc marine um stewardship council have got a a write-in with the national federation of fish fryers and um you know you can uh, they offer a kind of package to become msc certified along with getting a quality award from the national federation of fish fryers and so on um so i i you know i think i think i think the industry is to me it's surprisingly good at the quality end but you know it's the same in everything isn't it there's a there's a price for all of this and um uh, I think that the consumers, there's, uh, I think there's real evidence to suggest that um, con- consumers are aware of it and they are prepared to pay a premium to have the validation that their food has been well sourced and is, you know, sustainable and, you know, it's ethically, it's it's okay. Um, I think there's growing evidence of that. I think it's becoming more and more important. I've just, one of my kind of lockdown projects to remain positive has been to launch a new food brand and um, it's a chocolate brand. And um, it will, it is, I believe, the uh, first and only carbon positive chocolate brand in Scotland and possibly in the United Kingdom. Um, so, you know, these things are really important, um, whether it's, uh, you know, carbon credits, whether it's making sure that you're buying sustainably. I think it's really important that you're able to um, verify it. I think there's businesses out there, less scrupulous, that are making these claims and possibly spuriously. So, you know, it's really important that you're able to verify it through membership of, you know, legitimate bona fide schemes and that the consumers are kind of aware of that, that, um, you know, you can't take it for granted that all the chicken, the free range chicken you see on menus is necessarily free range chicken. Because if it is, I wonder where all these free range chickens are, for instance. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of greenwashing. As a matter of interest, how do you make a carbon positive chocolate bar? Oh, you have to be assessed. So, like you and I talking on this laptop is we are um, you. We you know we are we, we are using up um, you know carbon. We are we are. Uh, I'm just grateful now that I didn't drive up and see you, Sarah. Goodness me. <laughs> but yes, go on. So whatever you do, that it's um, you, you, you have to do an assessment. You have to be assessed, and there's, and then you can plant trees and the um, to offset the carbon that you are using up. So um, basically, what we're doing is we've teamed up with a local ecologist, 
who has a farm and she is planting a forever forest of um, sustainable indigenous um, native uh, Scottish variety of trees and um, we are buying her carbon credits. So we're, we are financing her forest, basically. Okay, yeah. Important work, getting the forest back. I've done a, I could do a podcast on that soon, but I just find forests are amazing. The fact that all these trees are actually communicating with each other under the ground and the mycelium. I read the book The Overstory recently. I don't know if you've seen that, but if not, I thoroughly recommend oh, it. wow, you're way ahead of me. But if you ever want to interview her, um, mm. she'd, be, she'd be great to talk to. Okay, perfect. What's her name? Uh, Fiona McClellan. Okay, we'll follow up on that because, uh, yeah, it's definitely in, a, in in the sweet spot of something that interests me. I've got a regenerative farmer coming on soon, actually, which is t- – we'll touch on it a little bit. But um, just on the on the broader perspective then, just, just you know, sort of sustainability, I suppose, of, of, of Scotland and suppliers, um, what's the impact been at the moment? You know, you, you, you how important – are you? You know, you're that route up. You're that welcome to the country, I suppose, and everything expands out from there. How how is Scotland coping in general? And I want to start to touch a little bit on the future, I suppose, of how we bounce back. Is is Scotland going to be ready if if the doors, if we're told we can reopen the doors? Is there enough of the industry? If there are enough businesses, is there is there enough suppliers who have been able to batten down the hatches and be ready to come out the other side of this? Well, that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to it, uh, but it's a worry. I think it's a good question because it's a bit of a concern. Um, I mean, I know that in Scotland, um, and I believe it's the same in England from the, some of the media stories I've seen, that we don't have the tourism infrastructure to cope with a, you know, a big surge in staycationing. So um, I believe that there were more people going abroad for their holidays in Scotland than there are beds available in Scotland. Uh, you know in from kind of normal times but now that people are not going abroad there's not enough facilities and last summer in the period that we were open we saw you know some really kind of dire squeezes on um, fragile rural environments um so if i just take ours for instance at tyndrum um you know, the toilets are not adequate and we don't have a single public car parking space. All the car parking spaces are privately owned. And um, things like this, there's, there's no um, facility for camper vans to empty out their toilet cassettes. So I've seen people emptying out their toilet cassettes in, you know, rivers and streams and all over the place, tucked away in corners when I've been out cycling or out running um and there was lots of problems with you know dirty camping and you know public toilets not being open and i don't suppose that was any difference in beauty spots around england either um so one thing is it's kind of big issue because we need to be working on the infrastructure certainly um, if Scotland is going to reach its goal of stated goal of being the number one tourist destination in the world by 2030 we've got a lot of work to do in improving and upgrading tourism infrastructure and that's is on you know a personal basis that's something i'm you know really keen to be involved in and involved in um I'm working on to try to um to lobby and to attain grants for making that happen and in particular I'm interested in disabled access and a network called Changing Places Toilets, which are for people that need to be hoisted onto the toilet. So I'm trying to kind of get those, um, one in Tyndrum and in other locations in Scotland. Um, So we've got an infrastructure issue, um, which kind of is a wider point, but it does play to the kind of, it is involved in the kind of whole hospitality recovery thing, okay? Because if we don't have the infrastructure, we're not going to be able to um, cope with all the people that could be coming. Um, I think we've also got issues kind of more at the kind of operational level because if you've got businesses that had, say, 1,350 staff before the pandemic, now they've only got 350 staff, um, where are they going to get, you know, where are all these staff suddenly going to come from overnight to fill the jobs and to get businesses back up and running you know they've got to be trained and 
Um, so that's that's you know that's potentially a really major issue, um, especially as some of these people may have left and gone back to Europe, and now that we're out of Europe, um, much harder to get people to fill these jobs potentially, certainly in remote locations like we are. And then there's the issue of all the staff that have been kept on um, furlough but have got used to not working. Um, and uh, oops, sorry, can you hear my? Is that, is that, is that a hungry dog? Yeah. <laughs> He's calling time. Yeah. He said, "That's that's your hour. Working Come on." From home. It, <laughs> at least I'm not also trying to do the homeschooling at the same time as talking to you and deal with the yeah. dog. I'm, um, I'm supposed to be doing that. Yeah. So. Um, you know, we've then got the issue of, you know, the staff that are on furlough and haven't been working for months and months and kind of getting people fit and, and ready um, to come back, energised, to come back to work. So there's kind of a whole lot of stuff from people who are on furlough to the people who have gone completely and the gaps that there are everywhere um, to the lack of working capital that exists now in all these businesses. We're all saddled with a ton of debt just to kind of get through it all. Um, and the lack of uh, infrastructure. Mm. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? I think that that potential demand, you know, with the, with the current situation of literally, you know, no no over overseas travel, pretty much. Uh, that's a phenomenal amount of, of extra demand to put onto the uh, onto the country, isn't it? Great in the fact, you know, I've got a, a, a hotel and a seafront restaurant, and, and I certainly want to be busy. But my goodness, I can't imagine this this pressure and the stress uh, that will put the team under. So it's yeah, it's going to be interesting. You, you forget about needing to get that infrastructure in place. We've got to draw to a close very shortly. So a couple of other quick questions. Do, do you think um, is roadside your niche? You've spoken about a couple of other businesses that you know direct to consumer online or, or chocolate but can you see yourself opening another sort of roadside cafe now that you've got such a great model um pr- probably not just because um we've got a different strategy um we actually want to spread our risk so we're going to open a fish and chip shop in glasgow um a takeaway a uh, click and collect and delivery with a dark kitchen behind it to uh, fulfill all the digital orders. Um, so we've got that going on. We've got the online cake retailing going on and we've got the chocolate business. So uh, I think we've got our hands pretty full. Yeah, you've got, you've got your work out. When does the Glasgow place open? Do you know yet? Um, sometime before the end of this year. But the priority at the moment is getting Time Drum up and running as soon as we can. So as soon as that is up and running... Um, so it'll be the second half of the year we'll be opening in Glasgow. Amazing. That's exciting. You, you've definitely got your hands full. Um, are there any are there any kind of positive changes, I suppose, off the, off the back of this? I'm thinking, for example, you know, a lot of people say that maybe there's a little bit more respect for uh, hospitality off the back of this. We've sort of held our heads fairly high despite being, you know, battered and, and vilified, I suppose. We know we've been feeding the NHS and uh, key workers and, and looking after people and sort of demonstrated, I suppose, that hospitality is a reflux, a reflex, not just a, a business. You know, we just, it's hardwired into our DNA that we want to look after people and maybe that's going to be better recognize but are there any other positive changes that you're sort of hoping will come off the back of this whether that's in our sector or, or humanity in general oh uh, <laughs> um i don't know about humanity in general i think um i think i mean for, for you know for ourselves the kind of i've touched on the kind of whole revolution in terms of it and the online platform has been you know that's been a revolution not an evolution um I don't know. I, I mean, I think the point you make about um, people, uh, we've held our heads high and, you know, hopefully more people respecting us as a result. And, you know, the general public have been cooped up for a long time. Um, people are really missing the whole environment of going out and even for a coffee or, you know, especially for a meal or to the pub. And, um, or for, you know, in my case, you know, a day trip up to the Highlands um people are really really missing that and so um you know i think I, I i like to think there will be a greater appreciation and um i think we have done you know as, uh, of, of both the industry and the individuals that have done so much to kind of remain positive and to help the wider community so yeah no i just echo really what you said perfect okay any any more uh iron man's booked in this year well, yeah, I am, <laughs> as, as it happens. Um, she says, looking out of the window into the snowy um, back 
backyard I've got here. Um, and snow and little thin tyres of uh, road bikes don't go together. Um, but, yeah, I'm supposed to be doing Ironman in Lanzarote on May the 25th, but I think it's getting slimmer chances every day at the moment. But That's really hard to motivate yourself to get out and train when you know it might not happen, isn't oh, it? Yeah. <laughs> I did two hours this morning on the indoor bike. Have you got any idea what that's like? It's well, I, I do, but I appreciate most people, only that I'm a Zwift person as well. So well, I, I say as well, that's what I use on my indoor bike. But, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough ask. Zwift definitely helps. Right. Okay. I'll bet. Have you ever used it? Do you know Zwift? Yeah. No. I've got. I've had enough yeah. technology. Um, okay. Work. It's a vir- virtual ride, basically. So you can go and climb Mont Ventoux, for example, which is a, a climb I did a couple of weeks ago, and I think it was an hour and forty minutes or something indoor. And there's no way that I would ride that hard or that long indoors if I wasn't, yeah, connected into a smart trainer and climbing a virtual mountain. But uh, gosh, if you're if you're doing it without tech, then two hours on an indoor bike is is even more impressive. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. Well, good luck if you do get to do it. I hope I hope you do. But the key thing is, look, you know, thanks. You've been a great voice. I've I've, I've watched uh, a few of your interviews. I've read plenty of the stuff. You know, you're you're very vocal and you articulate a great perspective uh, on behalf of the industry. And it, and it's nice to get somebody in a little bit further north than I than I always get. So thank you for sparing the time to chat. And I wish you the best of luck coming out the other side of this. And uh, I will come and visit. And hopefully we'll meet one day. Yeah. Maybe get Robbie to introduce us. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, well, I will. I love Scotland. It's beautiful. And in fact, uh, the only campsites near you, I'm looking, I'm trying to find somewhere to go with the uh, with the kids and we might just take the caravan up so we can be self-contained. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be in touch probably to find out somewhere nice. But for now, uh, best of luck with all of your projects you've got going on, Thank Sarah. Thank you so much. And you too. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Cheers. I really hope that was a useful conversation. I love Sarah's story. Once again, illustrating what a creative sector we are. Whatever is thrown at us, we'll try and find a way of evolving and changing our business models to survive, whilst always recognising that the customer is at the heart of what we do. Do head over to the show notes on the website to find the links to the Real Food Cafe and be sure to pop in and say hello to Sarah and her team if you find yourself heading north this summer. And remember, for really easy access to the show notes each week, you can sign up to the newsletter on humansofhospitality.co. UK, where you can also support the podcast financially via Patreon or PayPal. PayPal? PayPal. At the moment, I've avoided sponsorship, albeit if you're interested in sponsoring the show, do get in touch also via the website. Okay, I'll be back next Monday with a brand new show, either with Darren Venables, the estate manager from the Chute and Glen in the New Forest, where I had an amazing tour a couple of weeks ago, or with Hamish from the Secret Herb Garden based just outside Edinburgh. Both awesome conversations I'm really looking forward to sharing with you once I get round to edit to them. Okay, bye for now. Have a great week. Cheers.